everyone. All right, let's get started. Yeah, how's everyone doing? Surviving the end of semester? Yes, great. Okay, so my name is Tom, and if you haven't met me yet, uh, you should because your assignments are due today and I'm marking them. Um, uh, so I'm your TA for this class and I've been sitting there at the back making sure you don't escape. Um, but today I'm going to try to do a somewhat hopefully relatable and fun presentation um, about kind of how uh, I started sort of my um, young professional career. Uh, I finished my master's here uh, at McGill and I'm currently still doing a graduate diploma in performance, but I've been out of school for a year and I already see myself as sort of transi transitioning into a young professional. So um, today I just wanted to introduce to you some ideas and thoughts about entrepreneurship and what that means and how you can even as an undergrad, as a young musician, um, really invest in launching your career. Uh, and later on, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about using social media um, to promote yourself because we're sort of like the young, new generation. And even my younger brother told me that like Facebook is for old people now. It's like they all use Instagram to promote themselves. So I was like, wow, like old people use Facebook? So it's like really interesting that um, as generations coming through, um, social media is used in different ways and how can, we can explore that as musicians to our advantage. Um, so to get started right away, um, so first uh, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of entrepreneurship and what it means to be an entrepreneurial musician. Um, so. Um, do you guys know what is the difference between soft and hard skills? Has anyone heard of this term before? Yes. Do you want to shout it out? What is? What? Uh, hard skills are practical, practical things like you know fixing a bathtub or whatever. And soft skills are talking to someone or you know giving a presentation. Exactly. So hard skills are um, measurable abilities. So knowing how to play your instrument, to write a composition. Um, so those are practical skills and. Um, soft skills are more about relationships, communication, and things that you don't quite uh, are taught in school, but you have to pick up along the way as you're experiencing these things and doing your own projects and build on. Um, they're equally, if not more important than being in a practice room and making sure you're um, at the top of your craft, which of course is the foundation, but these soft skills Things um, sort of um, such as communication and time management, critical thinking, a lot of these things um, you have to really practice as well to be a successful professional. So um, I wanted to just uh, talk a little briefly about some of the traits of a successful entrepreneur. So first of all, discipline. So if you're a musician, um, we all have pretty good discipline, I hope. Um, a lot of us pianists are stuck in the practice rooms all day, so we work hard. Um, so work ethic for musicians and athletes, I think that's a given. So um, to maintain that is important. And the second one is confidence. And this is something I'm very interested in because I've talked to a lot of younger musicians about how it can really help them present themselves as um, a professional. Um, and there's this phrase, fake it till you make it, right? So um, how you hold your posture, what you wear, the way you speak, uh, the way you hold eye contact, those things all give cues of your confidence. But if you really live in those moments, you'll really believe in that and you'll really become that person. So um, for example, when you're going on stage, um, from the moment you walk out onto the stage, your posture, the way you hold up your chin, that all gives so many cues that we have to be aware of. And not just in performance, where you're talking to a sponsor, where you're talking to your colleagues and teachers. Um, how you present your confidence um, will make such an important impact. Um, and another thing, actually, um, what I wanted to say is 
um, how a lot of musicians present themselves before and after a performance, and how that can shape the audience's reaction to your performance. So, for example, we're all such perfectionists and very critical about ourselves, and we put in a lot of work, and after a performance, if someone comes to congratulate you, and you're like, oh, that really sucked, oh, I played terribly, um, that really, like, lets down the audience as well. It's like, they really enjoyed it, and they're trying to compliment you, and um, of course it's good to be humble, but at another point, you have to be proud of your art and the way it is at that moment. Um, we're never going to be ready, like, for a perfect performance, a perfect composition or paper, but the way you believe in your work, especially how you share it with other people, talking about it after a performance, it's just something to think about, um, to um, have a pride in your work. That's something, as you become a professional, that's really important to remember, just treating yourself like an artist. While you're students, you already should have and find ownership of your work. Um, a third, being open-minded. Uh, every, every event and situation is an opportunity. Um, and the people you meet, I'm sure you guys have heard this and it sounds very abstract, but just constantly seeking for new ideas, new people to collaborate with, new projects, it's sort of a habit um, to keep your eyes open for these things. Um, just thinking of every little uh, interaction as an opportunity. And fourth, you have to be a self-starter. So what that means, this I think is one of the most important things about entrepreneurship, uh, is that if something needs to be done, um, you should do it yourself. You should start it. You should go create that concert. If you want a place to play, find a place. Um, just, you have to do it yourself. Um, especially in this day and age, and not to ask for people's permissions. So I'm kind of, um, I've been always a little bit of a rebel. Like, I don't ask for permission to do things. Like, a lot of times you, sometimes you break rules, and a lot of us as students were like, are we allowed to do this? Can we do this? Um, but sometimes I just don't ask, I just do it. Like, the projects I want to do, and you got to take risks and be bold and just be daring about the projects and the things that you want to pursue. Um, so to be competitive means also, again, to be proud of your work. A little bit of competition uh, between your friends and colleagues is a good thing. Uh, and creativity and curiosity, uh, connecting between seemingly unrelated events, like a lot of cross uh, genre collaborations can happen. Uh, pianists don't always have to be with pianists, and we could reach across genres and talk to different people, and that's when a lot of fun ideas and projects start. And I'll get into some of the things I've done in more detail later. And strong people skills. This is something that's very, very hard for a lot of us musicians, especially my uh, group of friends who are often uh, the classical pianists. Uh, we're really afraid to talk to people. Uh, and what you come to realize uh, every year you get older is that not, no one really has it figured out. Like, um, people, and people are not scary. Like, all of the professors, all of the most incredible artists that you've seen, they've all been students. They've all had the same vulnerabilities and doubts and they all know what it's like to be a student and try to find your voice and try to struggle through it. And they're actually not all that, um, it's not like someone completely more authoritative than you. So a lot of the administration, a lot of your teachers, you can just talk to them like, like people and just ask for what you want. If you need something, if you want something, um, it's really not as scary and they don't see themselves either as this like high authoritative figure. So I think to see that and know that everyone's just figuring it out, like a lot of people doing their jobs are just figuring it out as they go along. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Everyone uh, has their vulnerabilities and to just be open and 
uh, be receptive of that. Um, and last, of course, passion. So this is a little bit cheesy, but I really like cheesy things. And I'm sure you guys are here because you love music, right? Yes? Yes, okay, good. Um, so I'm a bit of a nerd. I genuinely love my work. Uh, I love practicing, I love researching. Um, I just love working really hard and then going to celebrate afterwards. Sometimes uh, I don't practice for like weeks um, after a long stretch of really hard work. So I think um, that's just my kind of lifestyle, I guess. It's like push really, really hard and then reward yourselves. But everyone has whatever works for them. But there's got to be passion and sometimes you burn out, then you just, you know, take a few days off and recover and a lot of being an artist is we don't have this often consistent lifestyle, but I think that's what fires us, you know? Like, if we had this very stable, consistent, comfortable lifestyle. Like, I've been living out of my suitcase for about like six months, and it's just, everything seems constantly like a mess, and you're always putting out fires, but in a way that's, you could do that with a calm state of mind, and make it uh, sort of a fun challenge. And that sort of all fuels your art. So see, every challenge is kind of just a ridiculous sort of motivation to put into your music and arts, something like that. Um, okay. So these are, uh, I categorize as skills, but they sort of overlap um, with what I already talked about. So time management, very important. I mean, of course, you guys all know, uh, but developing good habits. So um, little things like getting good at replying to emails really shows how professional you are. Like even if you're busy saying that you'll get back to it or those things are all habits that throughout everyday interactions you can develop so that it doesn't become a chore. So. Um, if you do it consistently, then it will be part of your routine to see an email and be responsibly reply to a collaborator um, or a teacher. And those little cues all reflect on your character and people will remember that. They'll come back to you for important work or projects because you left that impression on them. And writing emails to follow up with artistic directors or presenters, um, those kinds of communications are so important and really worthwhile investments. Um, strategic thinking, coming to solutions, efficiency, resilience. Um, this is one of the biggest soft skills that we need uh, as entrepreneurs is how to handle rejections. Um, I heard this amazing TED talk by this Asian guy who's really afraid of people saying no to him. And so he had a project for himself where every day he gave himself a ridiculous task that he thinks people will say no. So like one day he brought a pot of a plant to someone's house and said, can I plant this in your backyard? And the guy's like, no. And so he keeps asking, he's like, why can't I plant it in your backyard? And the guy's like, well, I don't know. Like, I don't know you. But, and then once he went to like McDonald's and said, can I have 10 free burgers? And they're like, no. So it's like those little things really train him. And then it's crazy sometimes as you become more used to that, the amount of things you can get by asking if you're just not afraid to hear no. And the more ridiculous you sort of are with asking these questions, the braver you get. And it's crazy eventually the amount of things that you will be allowed to do. Um, so I think that's scary for all of us, not just musicians and artists, to ask for things and to be afraid of being rejected. Like I literally apply for every possible grant and competition out there. People are always saying you're doing these cool projects, but they don't know that that's only like 0.5% of the things that I apply to. So those are things, um, it's a lot about your pride, your art is your identity and your voice. So of course that's very personal and vulnerable but um, you sort of got to put yourself out there. Like, as music entrepreneurs, our product is ourselves. That's why it's very scary. We're not selling this bicycle where, okay, if you don't like how beautiful it is, that's 
that's fine. But we're basically selling our own artistic sort of ideas, which is very personal and very scary. But you still sort of got to just take a leap of faith. Um, when I was preparing for my recital, often you get to the last moment, you think, how did I ever think I was able to do this? Um, and uh, a great friend just said, it just takes a lot of preparation and hard work, and then at that moment, uh, a leap of faith that you did put in the work, and you just gotta trust that you can do it. Sorry, I'm not trying to do a motivational speech. Um, this is supposed to be, it'll be more practical in a little bit. Um, where was I? Yes, resilience. Communication, we kind of already talked about. Networking, so this is hopefully what we'll get to. I'm already short on time. Uh, in person and on online, how to develop networking. Another great tip I found is try to find mentors. So any person you admire, don't be afraid to reach out to them. Like, as ridiculous as it is, like write an email to like an artistic director or conductor or composer and seek for help, seek for advice on your projects. And great artists love helping young musicians. And if you find a few great mentors who have sort of went through what you have, they can give you so much guidance and so much support. Um, and I've had a lot of personal experience with this in Boston while I was at New England Conservatory. They're lasting friendships, lasting um, really valuable sort of relationships. So don't be afraid to just like reach out to people for help that you admire. Um, financing, don't let budgeting dictate your projects and dreams. So if you have an idea, there's always a way to find funding for it. Um, and branding, this is another thing. As musicians, we sort of focus on the abstract of our arts, but it's important to think about what makes you unique. Those are really hard things, right, to develop as a young artist, but what do you want your niche to be? Like, are you a person, like, I, I was thinking about this about myself, like, what do I do that I particularly love and defines me? I'm kind of this, like, bubbly Asian girl who likes playing a lot of recliners. Okay, that could be one thing. Or I like doing film projects, or um, little things that people can remember you by, because we all want to create great art, but um, branding, so like things that people can pick up on that are memorable and that define you, and that could be something uh, sort of superficial, like we remember Yu Jia Wang by her, you know, like the uh, the dresses she wears, or certain artists play a certain composer, or if you're into new music. So those sort of definitive qualities are good to think about. Do what you're good at. Um, and sales, that's more about if you're running a project, how do you reach an audience? Okay, I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. So all this is to say, um, pursue a variety of work and opportunities while you are still a student. Being a musician, um, we don't get our certificates and then go into the work field like doctors or you know engineers. So you're building your career while you are here. So um, as a soloist, chamber musician, uh, a producer, researcher, teacher. So I have a range of activities that I already do, um, and. I'm not going to go into my bio as I was planning to just share sort of the things I've been doing the past few years. Um, so, for example, so on the solo side, um, I'm participating still in competitions, contacting conductors, trying to play a lot of concerts and venues, and chamber music-wise, um, I put in a lot of research and effort to get my group's opportunity. So for example, a story of our trio with the Lunenburg Academy of Music, where uh, one year as students, we were invited to go there uh, to participate. And afterwards, I kept in contact with artistic director, and we kept emailing and saying hi on Christmas. Okay, this is the season where it's the greatest opportunity to send follow-ups and hellos to everyone you possibly know so they remember you just be like oh happy holidays i had a crazy semester blah 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 so that you stay connected with these people holidays um new year's great reason to reach out to people after you have a performance things like that oh anyways i was talking about this 
this festival. So eventually, a few, few years after, um, we wanted to go back, but we wanted to present ourselves now as working professionals. We want to be paid. We don't want to pay to go. So how to sort of transition from students to being hired as professionals, that was a tricky thing, and I, I had to negotiate um, and be clear about what we wanted because we're out of school. Um, we want to be uh, young professionals. And then they needed these artists to play on their Beethoven festival. So next year, um, it just happened that they remembered us and we got invited to play on their concert series. And now it's a wonderful opportunity that's also a paid professional gig. So those kinds of things just show, it's just one example of how your student connections can become professional connections very, very quickly. And I, I also play for Lincoln Center Stage. Any, have any of you guys heard of this program? Yeah, um, it's a cruise line uh, chamber music piano quintet program where I met a lot of great artists, a lot of great musicians uh, in New York. Um, and also, uh, next, uh, creative projects. So I'm also directing uh, sort of this arts initiative and entrepreneurial collective where a large, a large team of us artists across the US and Canada, we produce these multimedia concerts um, that, uh, this is really nerdy, that the stories are about this sci-fi universe. So it's an original, sort of like I think Marvel storyline, and a lot of artists through dance, music, theater, novels, movies, video games, we all illustrate this story. So it's a really fun project that we got funded by New England Conservatory, and eventually we applied for bigger grants, and a lot of great things come from these little ideas of things that you could do outside of your instrument. Um, I really need to fast forward. Um, so I also do research. I got a research from the uh, Canada Graduate Scholarship. Uh, so that's more academic. There's a lot of funding in research. How many people are in music theory and musicology? No one? No one. Okay. Well, that's okay. But, oh, that's the thing I wanted to say. Even if you're a performance or a composer, you can still apply for these things. And your master's is gonna come up really soon, so think about research and think about the ways you can get funding for these more academic subjects. Okay, one of the best ways to learn is to produce your own concert. That will teach you the whole process of being an entrepreneurial musician. So from any scale, just how, just try to go organize a concert with a few people, finding a venue, budgeting, marketing, reaching an audience, building your um, profile, and you'll learn it all. You just have to go do it. Don't just wait for your recitals. Try to go play somewhere, like next semester, just do it. Yeah, um, and apply to things. This is another thing, deadlines will motivate you. So our creativity thrives when we have limitations and deadlines. So I think Bernstein said this great quote that um, success comes from a lot of talent and not enough time. So if you find something to apply to that has a deadline, that will force you to think through your project, come up with a budget, and do something that's actually practical and tangible. So um, if you just have all these great ideas, we as artists often never get to them. I have a million projects going on in my head that I never get to. But if you apply for a grant, if you apply for a little competition, that's why we have recitals and deadlines like your assignments, um, that really forces us to actually come through and follow through. All right, I need to get to the actual part of this presentation. Self-promotion platforms. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff. So how to reach and connect with your audience. There's a lot of different social media platforms. So this is fun because we're going to get to look at Facebook and Instagram. So everyone pay attention now. Um, uh, so different people use different platforms. Depends on what you're familiar with and what you use the most. So for example, I don't use much of YouTube, but for a lot of you, that might be a great resource. And I don't use Twitter either. So my biggest things are uh, Facebook and Instagram and my own personal website. 
So first, I'll just show you a little bit of my website, which I built on Squarespace. Um, it showcases my biography and my personal statement. So this is something I want you guys to think about, is to write an artistic statement. Because um, it's really important to not just list your accomplishments. And I already said I'm a very cheesy person, but um, I actually believe in things I'm writing about. And um, an artistic statement helps people relate to you more as a person, as a human being. And it doesn't have to be a cheesy romantic style. Um, I have a friend whose artistic statement is very funny, very humorous and just more showcases the person in real life. Um, and so on my website, there's also work samples, audios and uh, videos. So I separated them into solo works and chamber works. So this was my recital, a lot of YouTube things. Um, when I just list them here, so it's easy for people to find. Um, and I have a tab that has my projects. So what I was talking to you guys about, the sci-fi universe, the multimedia universe, um, is called Sincora. Uh, and we produced two big concerts so far, one at NEC and one in Calgary. So we do a lot of artworks, um, different kinds of uh, art mediums like dance and theater. There's a lot of great artists who collaborate on this. I also, my research project is the Studio Ghibli project. Who has seen Studio Ghibli films? Great, you're all wonderful people. All wonderful human beings, I approve. So um, this is, my research is about cuteness in music. So they would fund that. So any crazy ideas you have, they probably, you can make a case for it. Um, so what does it mean? Why can cute music be valuable to our culture? Um, and they gave me a lot of money for that, which is great, um, which I haven't really done much with yet. Um, and updates and news, so personalize it. Um, I like to write these sort of blog style uh, posts. This is another project I'm doing with my duo uh, about sort of Chinese Canadian music. And just after every performance, I write a little bit sort of semi-personal um, things. And I also have a more, uh, uh, a less professional blog that has my food pictures and all of my travel stories. This is when I went on the cruise and I was trying to document the things I went to. And I also have an Instagram for like things I eat during my travels because I like eating and cooking a lot. And I host these salon concerts that are really fun and I get to cook a lot of food. Um, all right, so that's, I have sort of a personal part that I want people to see me as a relatable human being, not just a person who has played in these concerts and blah blah master classes, because everyone can list that. That doesn't define who you are as a person. All right, skip forward. I'm gonna skip through a lot of stuff. Okay, now we have an activity. Um, everyone, you're allowed to pull out your phones or computers. Yeah, do this. This is important. Okay. Now you can go to your Facebook app or go onto your Facebook on your computer. Okay, now type in search for T Wang Piano. Is everyone there? Yes. Yes, give me a cheer. T Wang Piano. Okay, so now. Once you're on that page, I would like you. Wait, I would like you to click on the like button, and and you have just earned yourself some extra credit for your assignment, which is due today. 
So I will, I will see all of your names, right? On the like, on my page. Yeah, also I'm trying to live stream this presentation. Great, which is a really important to, tool to use on your Facebook pages. And I have a friend who's starting this live stream service in Montreal, and it can help you. Oh look, I'm talking right there. 22 people are watching, that's not acceptable. There's like more than 22 people in this room. 25, look, it's going up. Yeah. Okay, great, yes, great uh, reward today. Um, so live streaming is great for your recitals, for your events, because people do watch this and you can reach a greater audience. My friend who's a great videographer, um, is starting a live streaming service, which is really fun to just play around with these new media ideas. What? So who has a Facebook page? Like, not a Facebook profile, but like an artist Facebook page. Music. Yeah, great. It's, it's hard to start at first if you don't have a lot of things going on. Um, and since we already have a personal profile, but uh, it's still good to build on it little by little and post and start sharing your personal things through your Facebook page and grow it. And there are some tools on Facebook that you could use because you can promote your events um, and uh, see sort of, you could create targeted ads to reach an audience who might be interested in your subject. Um, go back here. So I try to make, uh, so the website is the most professional and the Facebook is a little bit, slightly more personal. So the ways I write my posts, uh, I try to do a variety of different things. Things that are shorter, more crisp and funny, and promote my events, share my program notes. And I write a lot of um, personal feelings and sort of stories relating to the music, uh, throwback moments, little silly practice moments. I recently had this video of us four pianists trying to play a Schubert leader on one piano, and just like little things, depends on how you create, how you want to create your public image. Like what is sort of the personality you want to create. And you gotta be a little bit vulnerable and just be yourself, and if people don't like that, then that's too bad, because certain people will. And it's more fun to just be yourself, and there's always, social media is very hard, there's always a lot of sensitivities and people judging, but um, don't be afraid to be a bit bold and put yourself out there. There's this, for example, if you guys want cheesy, some of the things I wrote, this was back in the summer, so I usually share like a video, it's good, people really like videos of playing, uh, together with some thoughts is that readable? No, it's not. See, when I click more, and then it goes back. Anyways, so, <laughs> uh, sometimes I share these artistic thoughts. Uh, sometimes I write program notes. Uh, and it's just really what I want to say to my audiences and friends and listeners, anything that comes into mind. Sometimes it's not as serious. I try to, if I have a serious post, I lighten it up a little on the next one. Um, but yeah, uh, videos are important. People are attracted to visuals. Uh, and you can add your events. And even if it says three people are coming, but you should still do it. Because it's just, it's great to start building that. Uh, as a practice and just collecting. Because I'm in the process of doing this, um, trying to build my network and audiences. So it's good to start early. Um, oh, another story. So a tip. Okay, pay attention. Um, so Facebook is interesting. Uh, a lot of us, sometimes I'm a little disillusioned about social media because it seems a little bit fake. And some of the things I post on Instagram, I'm like, this is way too happy. This is not how I actually feel. I'm only talking about my successes and I feel like a fraud, but it doesn't have to be like that. Um, there's the image of you publicly is still a side of you. And there's the other side with your friends, you know, and 
but you have to try to create a public image. And being active on social media, clicking like on people's posts, making a comment, sending some stickers uh, or emojis or GIFs, those things really interact with people. Okay, the story, there's a story here. So I got this incredible gig with the Red Deer Symphony Orchestra this conductor because I kept in contact with him through Facebook. He's like this, this conductor. He's so funny on Facebook and posts all these ridiculous sort of pictures of him in random costumes and I would always comment on it and of course I would send professional emails, be like, I played my recital, I just learned this concerto. But then one day he just on Facebook Messenger was like, do you play Rock 3? And I was like, oh God. I was like, uh, I can play rock two. And he's like, no, it has to be rock three. And I was like, I guess I could learn it really fast. And then he's like, next season for our season finale, would you like to come play rock three with our orchestra? And just like that, it was from nowadays, the informal to the formal can happen in all kinds of platforms, just on Facebook Messenger, you know? Like, if you just, a lot of these professional artists are on Facebook or on Instagram, and just by reminding them that you're there, that you're active, it all goes to the back of their minds. Um, and so a wonderful, like I got to realize one of my biggest dreams, uh, and that moment happened on Facebook Messenger. I remember where I was, like at home practicing, and it was so exciting, these things that eventually pay off. And you never know, like sometimes you'll have slumps where you have no performances, and sometimes they'll all be happening. So that was, a fun story of mine. Okay, forward. Instagram. Uh, you guys should also follow me. Um, Sky.pianist. Um, so Instagram I see as sort of the most personal and daily life, but different people use it in different ways. So it's more a snapshot of your personality. It could be more fun and informal. And in a way, it reaches a broader audience than Facebook because it's not just your friends. Somehow it's both less personal and more personal at the same time. So, um, because you can follow people without adding them as friends, right? So, if you use certain hashtags, you can reach people who like the similar things you, you like uh, and connect with a broader audience. And you can also have, has anyone tried to use this business account on Instagram? Yeah, oh, awesome. So it gives you insights to how many people uh, sort of your posts have reached, uh, and you can also do promotions like on Facebook um, and using hashtags, connecting with other artists who are interested in your subjects. So I want to show you one of my friends. He's a European pianist. So as a soloist, he basically built his career just through a lot of Instagram like connections. Um, he like has 10K followers, which is remarkable for a solo pianist who didn't, like, win the huge competitions, you know? Like, you don't have to build your career through traditional methods. And a lot of, he's in Europe, a lot of amazing salon concerts, a lot of venues, just, like, saw his posts. There are a variety uh, of stuff from personal, uh, a lot of his travel stories, and just how, no. <laughs> All right. Well, that's okay. He's a handsome guy. All right. Okay. Um, so that's a really incredible case of just being discovered on Instagram. He's, he told me stories of he got so many concerts. People message him, stock little clips. You could post only one minute videos, right? So the short length. Um, it's got to be themed content, really fun, really captures uh, the materials. And what really helps is if you have sort of one style. So some people have, they focus on practice videos and people will follow you if you post regular practice videos. Or if you have art that's sort of one style, um, that also helps. I, I still sort of mostly use my Instagram as a sort of personal, I don't have a consistent theme, but I sometimes share it on my uh, Facebook page. But mine are sort of more like daily updates and a lot of cat videos and food pictures um, just to show sort of my life outside of the practicing. All right, so getting close to the end. Um, so in conclusion, I have a lot of these notes that I skipped over, but I just think 
you want to sort of think about how to build your story. Um, and I encourage you uh, to read some of the things I wrote on my Facebook page because I think um, I'm trying really hard to be a sincere artist and share things that could be scary, thoughts that we all sort of have but don't really talk about, and just to know that there's a network around you that people feel this way and people understand, people have been through it. It's a really amazing way to connect with people and at festivals I've met when I was speaking to younger pianists and musicians, they were really touched and really helped by this. So that's why I wanted to write these posts about performance anxiety, about the struggles of an artist, about feeling sad or emotional or feeling happy. Um, just sort of uh, real like people feelings and um, struggles and shared experiences. So be a little brave about marketing yourself. Um, and like I said, some people think it's scary if you go up and ask for opportunity or if you feel like you're selling yourself. Um, but we gotta kind of play the game. And an artist in this day and age, first of all, yes, your craft has to be incredibly top-notch. Um, but then there's such a huge complexity of factors around that to let you share your art with more people in a meaningful way. So the more expand your network, the more opportunities will come your way, um, and you never know which connections they can lead to. Um, and hashtag have fun. Uh, Monday motivation. Uh, we're almost close to the end of the semester, and I really like this picture of uh, one second. Smile and have a cookie. I don't have cookies for all of you, I'm sorry. But um, you can get a cookie somewhere and you'll feel better. Okay. Great. Questions? Please. Could you give an example of uh, one of these, like, you know, this is what my recital has been like, or what my month has been like, what my year has been like, emails that you send to these industry professionals. Oh, yes. Because that's a, a very specific thing, and it would, to me, feel very strange to email someone I've worked right. with and be like, hey, just so you know, this is what I've been working yes. on. Yes, yes. It's not strange at all. You just just do exactly that. Like, um, I I have some templates of things I've written, like thank you letters, touching base. Uh, I could definitely post some of those. Uh, depends on your relationship with the person. Like, if you haven't spoken with them for two years, you might write the email differently. But usually, I'm like with my teachers or conductors, be like, oh, it was great performing with you last time. I just did this list of stuff and I learned this and I'm really excited to be back, or something like that, you know? Um, different for every person, but um, I can share that with you guys if that's something that's useful. There's a lot of resources. If you guys have follow-up questions afterwards, just please email me or come talk to me or message me on Facebook or something. I actually contact a lot of people through Facebook Messenger, so any questions is fine. Anything else? What else? No, everyone's scared. Ask a question. Yes. Well, should you wait until you have some projects under your belt before you create your website, or do you um, create your website just to have some people like they stumble across it, they can follow it, have you? Right. That's a really good question. It's like, when do you create your website or your Facebook page? If you don't have a lot of regular posts, does that seem like you're not doing a lot? It's like, it's a kind of bizarre. It's like like chicken and the egg process, right? Same with grant funding, it's like, oh, you should have the money so we know you can do your project, but it's like, wait, you haven't given me the money, so how will I know I have the money? So uh, it's this weird loop that, so at, at a certain point, it's okay to have a simple website. Uh, when I started, very, very simple, just contact info, bio, you don't have to list an event page if you don't have a lot going on, but if you have a few projects, just something people see and have a sense that Oh, wow, professional. The moment they see you have a website, the feeling is much more like this person's got their crap together. Like, so that is just a great sense. And then gradually you can add to it and fill it up. But be minimalist, like um, even like one or two pages contact and bio looks great, yeah. Great investment. It's 
like, yeah. Yes, here. Uh, Social media, I think social media, like things like Instagram and Facebook is easier in a way. Because um, to me, they're more personal. So it's part of like more fun just using them daily and uh, getting into a habit. Also finding a balance of not being obsessed about your Instagram. But uh, that and link that to your website will help. So start, I think it's, it is easier to start a little bit from Instagram and you can even put your Instagram on your website and things like that. Yes, does that answer kind of your question Yeah. Yeah, okay, and here? Oh, yes, probably. I, one of my goals is to pick up my French because I want to network in Montreal, but definitely the more languages, of course, the better. Like, it gives you more chance to connect with other audiences or even your own languages. Um, uh, helps you connect with a different group. Yes, I should do that. Good idea. Yes. Anything else? Did you guys have fun? I was kind of nervous for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so